Britain. Uh, we're bringing this to you from the Open to Export service, which I think most of you will have um, seen. It. And a program of webinars that we've been doing across multiple sectors and topics and this week we've been doing two webinars on this particular sector I'll talk about those in a moment and the information you need. Um, things are going pretty well at the moment. We get something like 30,000 visitors a month and what we're finding is that people are asking for very particular topics and feedback and that's what we're trying to do with these webinars. For food and drink, um, what we've been doing this week is started with um, a session Tuesday of this week which is going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, probably early next week where we talked about the export opportunities for the sector and two great examples of how to do it in two different, very, very different scenarios. Today we're picking up on three of the very specific areas for questions that came out either before the webinar or, or since. What we're going to do is recap on why you should consider exporting, how to get a variety of government support from UKTI, and then look at two very particular um, issues, one around regulations and how you navigate through uh, the various rules, and the second is looking at your channels to markets and your um, your choice of distributor. In order to get the best value from this webinar, we've got um, three uh, excellent speakers that will be talking you through um, their particular topics. And you'll get the opportunity to ask questions by typing into the box that's on the screen in front of you. Um, hopefully, uh, those of you that are on have clicked the right button so you can hear me. If you can't, um, I guess there's nothing I can do. But if you have questions, just type them in. I'll see them. And through the webinar and at the end for 10 or 15 minutes, I'll be asking questions of the, uh, of the speakers. But what we're going to do first is start off with a little poll. Because what we're trying to understand from uh, everyone in the audience is where you're at in your export journey. And what we mean by that is, are you just considering exporting? Are you getting started and your toes have been experienced? And that will help us gauge the kind of contents and questions that we should be uh, uh, getting ready for. So most of you are voting. While you're doing that, I'll uh, introduce you to our next speaker, our first speaker. Lucy Randolph is an international trade advisor with UKTI. Um, Lucy spent over a decade working with exports and exhibitions, actually, across a variety of um, food and drink, um, food service and hospitality companies. Um, she's also worked in publishing and conference production, and um, I think has an awful lot to talk to us about on how UKTI can help you figure out the map of your journey of exporting. I'll just close down the poll. We'll take a quick look at the results. And what Lucy should be able to see before she gets going is a fairly even split of the various types of exporters. Lucy, are you ready to take us through a few minutes on yes, export yep. journeys, please? Yes, certainly am. Okay. Um, yes, hello. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Lucy Randolph. I'm one of the international trade advisors here at uh, UKTI London. And I'll take you through sort of quickly why, why, just very briefly, why companies should export. Um, and then um, I will take you through sort of what UK can actually do um, uh, for, for companies who are looking at it or, or getting started and experience export as well. Um, so bear with me. Before, in, before you continue, through. sorry, that, that's fine. I was just checking that Ward had stopped sharing the screen. Carry on. Fine, fantastic. Uh, yes, we look at why companies should export. So companies that export are actually 11% more likely to, to actually stay in business. Um, and if you become an exporter, the evidence shows that you're actually likely to improve your 
productivity by a third in your first year alone, which is actually very interesting. Um, I think that, sorry, bear with me, this is all down on me. I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, and sort of the benefits for for working for businesses can be that you can sort of achieve high levels of growth that you possibly couldn't do domestically, possibly in a fairly saturated market like the UK. Um, and it can increase the sort of resilience of your revenues and profits. It can spread your business risk. Um, you can achieve economies of scale that possibly you wouldn't be able to do um, just just dealing in the UK market. Um, and you know you can increase those sort of returns into R and D, improve your financial financial performance, um, and improve productivity. So, and it's all about sort of boosting your profile and recognition um, internationally. Cool. Um, and in terms of where you can export to, obviously you, you've got your sort of usual markets that people are aware of, which is the EU um, and the USA. Um, but there, there's also the sort of developing markets, the ones where there are very much uh, opportunities um, and coming opportunities as well, um, and what we call our lovely acronyms, which is the BRIC market, which we, we actually call Brazil, Russia, India, and China, um, and indeed the CIVIT market, which are Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey, and South Africa. So those are some, some sort of key markets that we are looking at and focusing on at the moment, and lots, lots of companies are actually looking at these markets and doing quite well in them as well. Um, so just to do a bit of an overview of UK Trade Investment, we have over 2,400 staff, of which 1,300 of them are actually overseas in our British embassies and consulates around the world. So we have over 100 um, embassies and high commissions. Um, and we have about 400 advisors, like myself, and support staff in about nine English regions. Um, in London, we actually work very slightly differently because we're actually sector focused. So in fact, I am actually one of the specialists on the food and drink side of it. Um, we do have champions in other regions, but they do tend to be more sort of general, mainly because of postcodes and distance, etc. cetera. Um, and over the, over, well, over the years, UKTR have assisted on about 24,000 uh, companies um, and helped them to explore opportunities overseas. So you can actually find out a lot more about this on our on our website, which is ukti.gov.uk. So you can have a quick look at that as well. Um, and what we can actually do for you is we actually sit down and look at your company and this advice. Um, we can give you. We can help you potentially. And, um, and we can actually market and actually support in some cases um, business to markets and actually help in the market itself. And in terms of us international trade advisors, all of us are actually experienced international business people have worked in exports previously, run businesses. So a lot of our advice um, it, it should hopefully be relevant and actually you know appropriate to your business. Lucy, can I just um, yeah. up in for a second? On the previous sure. slide where you talked about support in markets, I think yeah. a couple of people aren't quite sure. If you guys are based in the various regions in London, how do you provide that support in market in the country you're talking about? Well, obviously, because we have our um, 1,300 staff overseas, um, obviously we have commercial officers who are on the ground um, in those markets. Some are specialists in your area, some aren't, but we are able to do research through our commercial officers um, over in those markets to be able to, to get that sort of on-the-ground knowledge um, you know, to you in terms of market research or contacts, etc. So we actually work, we very much sort of conduct to work very, very closely with our commercial officers in the specific markets around the world. That's excellent, thank you. Does that help you? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so just to sort of go over um, what, what UK Trade and Investment can, can actually help you with on the export side of it. Um, we, I, I like to sort of divide it down into sort of programs and services. And, and, and two of the programs that we actually do offer, um, one of them um, is for very sort of new um, exporters. Um, and the one up from that is actually either graduating on or for more experienced exporters. But the one for them um, and like the one up, this is actually a um, where you work very closely with an international trade advisor um, and you sit down and you put together a sort of an action plan and in trade review so we look at your company um, and then we put together an action plan for the year of, of 
how you know how this could work and how we you know this program has a 500 pound plus VAT commit, commitment fee. However, you do get up to 3,000 pounds worth of, of matched funding that can go towards many different things. It could be travel and accommodation. It could be marketing, etc. So this is actually a very, very good start out um, program for, for companies. You actually get um, involved in um, an overseas workshop that can be quite helpful for startups, even the networking side of it of other companies joining the workshop and talking to you about how to export for the first time can be of, of quite a lot of, of value. Um, and um, you know it can help sort of you know this can help you give you a bit of support and help you gain your confidence and, and, and also have a sounding board um, in that sort of first year that you're looking to export and then moving on um, once you've, you've gone through this process um, it will take you through to the gate the global growth um, uh, program which is actually one year long as well uh, MBA standards, they're extremely high level and just absolutely fantastic um, that you're actually able to access on this program. So that can be of a lot of help for companies who are still wanting to keep learning um, about, about exporting. Um, and then obviously we, we then move on to our sort of services side of it. So we have our overseas market introduction service. Now this this service is basically the sort of the main service that we do that works all over the world. This is this is a study is, is on the ground. Um, so you get specific in market knowledge as we were talking about before. Um, so it is a chargeable service. Um, it is heavily subsidized um, by UK Trade Investment, but it gives you the opportunity to maybe do a little bit of research um, on a market. And if you're a food and drink company, you might want to look at some potential distributors or buyers. Um, and they can do that research for you. They can actually look up those potential distributors or buyers, you know, if to give you the contacts, and they can take it all the way, possibly take it all the way through to actually start meetings for you. So all you have to do is fly over and take the meetings. So th this is a very, very good service. Um, and it, it can actually be pretty much anything you like it, you want it to be. It's a very broad kind of service. But I've just given you a quick example of the one that we do a lot for the food and drink companies. Um, and moving on to our trade access program, trade show access program, our TAP, we have a series of grants available for um, for the trade shows um, that that uh, UK Trade and Investment support. So we do at some of the big food and drink trade shows around the world. We have the British Pavilion at these shows and you can take some space on that British Pavilion, you know, take advantage of exhibiting with us. Um, and you know, there are there are certain grants available um, for you to help with your sort of stand build and cost, etc. So this can actually be a very useful um, useful tool for companies. Um, and then moving on to um, sort of a couple of other services that we do, we do an export communications review, which can be of help when you're looking at your website or, or your marketing material. And we can look at that in terms of your export markets that you're looking to go into. So, you know, we could look at it in terms of you're looking to perhaps um, set up a, um, you know, a, a, a page for China. Um, so you make sure that you, you're able to, to communicate with um, you know, potential distributors or buyers in China, um, then we can actually help you set that up and, you know, put things through um, and, and, and look at the back end side of it and what search engines you should be on. It's, it's a very good service. It's sat on a couple of myself, really worth doing. Um, and, um, and then we have our export marketing research scheme, which is, is much more for sort of more experienced companies who can take time out of their business and actually to do research on markets rather than sort of a sales trip, research on market size and segmentation, regulations, that kind of thing. And it usually, usually leads to like a couple of weeks in a market going around doing the research, finding out if your product is actually um, available, you know, you know, actually going to work in that market and if the potential customers are out there. Um, and, and then obviously, um, you know, one of the main things that we do is moving on to our um, website as well. We have a lot of information that goes through our website, which you can see the, the web, 
web addresses below, have a lot, lot of opportunities that are actually, you know, for companies that come up on the website. So it, it's worth keeping an eye out on our website, signing up to it, so that you, you have to make sure that you get mailed about all these opportunities that come up, these events, these exhibitions, all the things that we're involved in. Um, and then obviously there's the open to export which is obviously with, you know, what, the, what this uh, webinar is through, um, where you can actually ask questions um, of, you know, of your fellow community, um, of you know, any questions you do have about the export industry, and um, anything that perhaps you know, you'd like a quick answer to, you can do that. Um, so yes, I gave you a very, very quick view for that, very quick overview of, of what we can do and what we're doing at the moment. And then obviously what we're looking to do in the future is, is strengthening sort of our overseas business network. So there's a lot more being done. Um, it, it's all quite exciting at the moment actually. There's a lot more being done. That the services that we can offer, we're hoping to be able to offer a lot more to companies um, sort of by 2017 there'll be a lot more services on offer by it, which is slowly having to be put into process. There's an £8 million pilot program in 20 markets um, going on at the moment, which will hugely enhance the sort of support that, you know, we're giving to SMEs over the next few years. Um, and, um, and, yeah, and we're working continuously to keep rolling these things out into further markets. It's all quite exciting, very important you stay in touch with or, or get in touch with international trade advisors so that we can actually, you know, keep, keep, keep you informed of everything that's going on. There is such a lot. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please, obviously, do, do let me have them after, after this presentation. Thank you very much. That was um, very useful. Thank you for that. We have got a fair number of questions coming in. I'm, I'm sure. conscious of the time. So what I wanted to do was um, I'm going to put up the next poll so that people can take a look at our next question, which is really where people go for their um, export queries. And that will yes. give people a minute or so to start answering. Um, <clears throat> there are some of the questions that I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to be uh, bringing up at the end when we're open discussion. But there's um, two that I think I want to pick up now. One is people I think have been saying, these sound very interesting, certainly those people that have heard of others that have used them. What's not quite clear is the kind of costs involved, particularly in things like OMIS, and if there are TAP grants available. Um, what are the sort of ballpark figures? Is there any way of generalizing on some of that while people are in the poll? Yeah, I mean, I can give you a little bit of a ballpark. I mean, obviously, you know, it, 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 it does ever so slightly vary, not by a lot, but it does slightly vary from market to market. Because obviously, we have extremely busy markets, like our sort of US markets, et cetera. So it very much does depend on that. I mean, something like um, something that I was talking about with a little bit of market research and then looking at maybe trying to find out maybe five you know, potential, um, you know, if, and if then we sort of produce a list and then give that to you and you do the following up. Um, on it, then something like that can cost you up to maybe, maybe sort of five to eight hundred pounds. Um, and then if you, you know if you're wanting to take it much much further, um, then obviously we, you know we could be looking up between anything between sort of fifteen hundred. So they could set up meetings for you and get it you know all all done and dusted. So all you have to do is turn up and be anything from sort of fifteen hundred to maybe two thousand um, pounds. So I mean it does it does very much depend. And it also um, there are actually a few schemes running at the moment where in fact if you've never had one of these services with us before, you actually get fifty fifty percent off your first onus that you do do with us, which okay. is quite is quite a good thing to take advantage of at the moment. Um, and in terms of the tap, sorry, I hope I don't go on too long, do cut me off. <laughs> in terms of the tap side of it, um, yes, I mean, for, for a European exhibition, if you're exhibiting on the British Pavilion, you probably get a tap of maybe up to maybe 1,800 pounds. If you're doing something in much further away market, you know, like a more developing market like the UAE or China, etc., it can be anything up to sort of 3,000 pounds. I mean, it, it's very much gauged on which market you're going into. Okay, that was very helpful indeed. What I'm going to do is actually move us on, and so I'll hide the poll results which you just had up in front of you. And what I'm going to do is take us on to actually an, a direct answer to one of the questions where a couple of people have asked what the main regulations are to consider when you're exporting food. I think that's a perfect segue into our next speaker, Richard Drummond, Deputy Director from DEFRA. Um, Richard's going to be talking us uh, through um, some of the regulations that apply in his particular space. But I think there are two ways in which people should be listening to what he has to say for the next few minutes. One is if you're in the right space that we're being talked about, it's a very insightful set of views on what the particular rules are and how to, to um, understand them and get the right help. The second, though, is that if you're not quite in this space, 
um, it gives you a sense of how much detail knowledge you need about your particular sector. So if in your space you either have someone in your organization or someone helping you that can talk at this level about regulations, you're probably okay. If you find that the people you're working with don't quite have the level of knowledge that Richard's about to speak to us about, then you probably need to look for some help. I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. But Richard, if you're there, over to you, please. Yes, um, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Drummond, Deputy Director in DEFRA with responsibility for trade facilitation of animals and animal products. Um, throughout this, um, I'm going to concentrate on exporting to countries outside of the EU, or what we refer to here as third countries, not to be confused with third world countries, which are something completely different. Um, we, we have evolved this for a number of years. We certification is required for the export of a number of different products um, and the um, animal food and drink. Um, the whole rationale for having export health certification is to ensure that countries that are importing the goods um, can confirm to their own people and their own population. All of the uh, conditions that need to be met have been identified and can either be provided through certification or through some other method. The penalty for not doing so, our experience has shown, is that consignments get held up at the port of entry and this of course can be extremely expensive uh, in relation to demurrage charges and even the possibility of consignments having to be applied. So, um, Again, our experience has shown that you really need to build in quite a lot of time in planning for your exporting and how you're going to send consignments um, to be able to obtain the certificates that you need. Some of these are already agreed and very readily available, and so it's just a matter of just going through a very quick process to get them. But for others, they haven't been agreed, and sometimes that period of negotiation has to be done by us here in DEFRA uh, to be able to agree those specific conditions that will allow a certificate to be produced that then can go with your consignment. Some of that can take quite a long time, and so if you are considering exporting, um, check to see first if a current certificate exists, and we'll come on to that in a minute. If it doesn't exist, be prepared for the fact that it may be quite a long time to negotiate it. This next slide um, has a lot of detail in it, and I'm not intending to go into it uh, in great detail. Um, it does, on the left-hand side, set out the main principles that you need to bear in mind when you're thinking about exporting. The rest of the slide is concerned with providing you with some links and some information about where you can go to get more uh, information about the things that you want to export. Uh, if I could just interrupt for just one moment, just to remind everyone that this um, webinar is being recorded, it'll be available for people to download and they'll be able to spend as much time as they'd like going through that slide um, uh, starting next week. Great, thanks. Yes, I understand this is going to be available on the Open to Export site? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Good. for putting the slide in just to give you the information that part is that it isn't people involved and it's important to try to point you in the right direction as early as we can. So what are export health certificates? Well essentially they are paper documents and that remains the case at the moment um, that are have been uh, formulated so that they um, can when they are signed by an official veterinarian or an official inspector provide the guarantees to the importing country that the consignment actually of what the uh, consignment is, where it's come from, the production methods that have been used, and in many cases, particularly with animal products, that the country from which it comes is free of certain diseases. 
One point I would like to make at this particular um, stage is that, of course, there are very few standard certificates. One of the big issues for us is that many of the third countries that we deal with have very differing requirements. Um, we do our best to try to standardize these, but uh, we're not completely in control of what an importing country might ask. Hence the need, as I've already mentioned, to build in as much time as possible to do it. I mentioned that uh, the certificates need to be signed by official veterinarians or official inspectors. The majority are signed by OVs, as we call them. These are um, qualified veterinary surgeons who are appointed by the government to act on behalf of the government to actually testify that the goods are as they are and meet the standards that are there. And we set great store by this, and we have a very rigorous appointment and monitoring procedure to make sure that this work is being carried out properly. Um, and we also produce notes for guidance that help these OVs with the interpretation of uh, some of the conditions that are on there if necessary. In terms of where the certificates are produced, um, in Great Britain, these are produced by the Animal Health Veterinary Laboratories Agency Service Centre in Carlisle. In um, Northern Ireland, they're produced by the Department for Agriculture and Rural Uh, the age of the sport submit certificate exists. This will then be nominated, who will then work with you to check the consignment and actually get it signed off. At the moment, there is no charge for the export health certificate. The official vet will make a charge, uh, make a fee rather, for, for completing the certificate, and, and we'll do that. Hi. So I'm just moving, going to move, waiting for the slides to move on. Um, the next slide. Um, it's just a little bit about any supporting certification that is required. What I've described up till now is the sort of standard, if you like, the norm for certification. In some cases, it's necessary for additional assurances uh, about the consignment um, to be provided. Um, and examples of these are certificates of free sale or, in relation to some of the meat that we export, um, halal certification, which uh, attests to the way that meat has been produced. Um, I would also like to flag up on behalf of my other colleagues that there will be also likely to be other financial and customs certification or documentation that you need to obtain. Uh, and you will get, of course, that information through uh, Open to Export and other uh, sites like the UKTI site and the HMRC site as well. A little bit about certificates of free sale. These are produced by the Rural Payments Agency, which is part of DEFRA as well. This is a non-statutory service, and it's not produced at no charge to exporters, um, and essentially uh, attests that the material is on free sale in the UK, because that obviously provides importing countries with some reassurance about the safety of the products. Our experience is the certificates of free sale are normally required by um, uh, countries in the Middle East, but of course any country is at liberty to ask for these if they want them. So if you need further advice on these certificates, contact uh, the Rural Payments Agency at, again, the web link that is given at the foot of the slide. I, I mentioned earlier the need to uh, work very closely with colleagues in the country to which you're hoping to send the consignment. Um, this is really important because uh, we do from time to time get um, minor variations or changes to certification and sometimes these aren't communicated uh, to us very quickly. 
if you've got contacts in these countries, sometimes they can give you the heads up about this, and it means that we can then um, get in contact with these countries and just check the position out before you send the consignment, because the last thing that any of us want is for you to send a consignment and then find that it hasn't been allowed to enter into the country. I would like also to mention that there are some countries, um, for example, um, and these are just examples, South Africa and Australia, who also operate a system of issuing specific import permits for consignments. Usually, um, these will line up very well with the export health certification that we provide, but it is always worth checking that. Sometimes, if they ask for something new and it's not on our export health certificate, we need to know about this quickly. Um, and colleagues in the Animal Health and Veterinary Laboratories Agency can provide advice on this. So I think uh, just to finish off then, just to say then that the first point of contact for all um, animal uh, export queries and including animal products um, and other foodstuffs, or many other foodstuffs because it doesn't cover absolutely everything, is the uh, HVLA office at Carlisle. They've got a fund of information and knowledge there that they can exchange with you. There's more information also on take any questions uh, in due course. Thanks very much for listening. Richard, thank you for that. There's been a whole stream of questions coming in, and um, as with before, what I want to do is run the next poll and then put a couple of them to you and then okay. save a few for later. So what we're going to ask people to tell us about now is the routes to international markets that they're currently exploring. So while everyone's ticking their various buttons on that, which I think are self-evident. Um, there seem to be three types of question coming through. Um, I think most of them are people asking about um, other sectors, so for example, alcohol, um, non-meat products, um, someone is asking about chocolate. If you're in the business of those sorts of um, food and drink um, categories, um, is there an equivalent set of details that someone should be able to find quite easily, or is it about picking up the phone to someone? Where would you suggest they get the, the version of what you've just done for their sectors? Um, I think that does vary a lot, and I think um, if they can't get that through looking either at the DEFRA website, then I suggest they go through to the UKTI website and make contact that way. Um, that's about all I can suggest. I, I, I We are dealing in my department only with a relatively limited um, portion of the food and drink sector. Okay, because I think um, one of the things I forgot to mention is that as part Part of the food and drink fee that you put on that open to website signposting for where people can get, I guess, a version of the kind of slides that you've just been doing for their particular space. But I think what you're saying is they need to go to the relevant place and, and look for the, the particular rules. Is that is that it in a nutshell? You still there, Richard? Okay, it looks like Richard has dropped off. Let me close the poll and see what the results are. And the results that we found so far are that most people are using a distributor, but um, only just. And I think that's probably a very good point for us to move on to our next speaker. Because one of the things that we've been finding with our questions so far is that whilst people know that they need to think about how they're going to be approaching exports, and while they um, know where to get sources of advice and regulations. Where they seem to be very unclear is how do I find a distributor who can represent me most effectively? I think most people are then comfortable once they've found a good distributor or a good channel. But actually picking the right channel, um, picking the right distributor, that's something where we're getting a lot of uh, quite difficult questions. And so we've come to Jerry O'Reilly, founder of itradein.com. Jerry's a, an entrepreneur from Belfast who's worked in the food industry for um, it looks like 20 odd years, Jerry. And, and um, Jerry's going to be talking to us about the food and drink sector. Jerry, over to you. 
Well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. As my name is Jerry Bray, and from iTradeIn.com, and here to speak to you today about potential export channels to to reach the markets that you're going after. And as by way of a, a bit of an introductory on our slide, there you have the top six countries listed that um, the uh, UK exports of food and non-alcoholic drinks go to and Ireland is number one. So there you are, moving on from that then. Next slide please. So uh, assuming that you've done your research uh, on the, the markets that you're trying to uh, enter and you've worked alongside the UK TI guys, then there are different routes to market that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, there are the traditional routes to market, which is going direct or using a distributor or with a broker or, or an agent. And um, probably what I'll speak about a little bit longer is using an online strategy through your, your own website and e-commerce or B2B. So the, the first route that I noticed in the poll that was very popular is going direct. And what I would say about that, of course, is when we talk about going direct, that's when you've gone to, say, the, the, the market or gone to the trade show and you've, you've picked up some business. So you're dealing with this directly yourself. And I'd say that's a very good approach, albeit it is very time consuming, as you would imagine, because you want to get repeat business in any of these markets. And so it's quite difficult for you to be doing this on a regular basis. Um, and it's unlikely that you would set up a presence in a particular market directly because of the cost associated with that. So whilst the polls seems to indicate that quite a lot of people do go directly, I would say initially for those starting out, it's probably not the best way to do it because it's likely that you would want to go uh, through a distributor would be uh, the next slide that we're going to talk about. And the advantages of using a distributor is that the, the, the particular distributor in a market has already got a customer base and they have the resources committed to that particular market. They probably have storage facilities and, and, and obviously distribution to stores and wholesalers and restaurants and whatnot. And that is a good way to enter any market because if you partner up with a distributor, as we have done in the past, it's a, it's a good long-term uh, relationship uh, that can be built up. Uh, but obviously, you are giving away some uh, control there, and you're giving away some profit margin. And what I would say also is that when choosing a distributor, you want to be certain that your product is going to get a fair hearing, as in not too many other competitive products you want to be you know, going up against within that distributor. So sometimes people go for exclusivity agreements, uh, but there are all many things to consider. Uh, in the next uh, slide, we talk about probably the easiest way to start uh, getting into a marketplace is striking up a relationship with an agent or a broker. I know we've had quite a lot of experience with this ourselves. And what I would say about working with a broker is that a broker is motivated, or, or an agent is motivated by uh, being able to achieve sales of your product and therefore make some money. And that's really what their prime uh, motivation is. Therefore, if your product sells well, the agent will attempt their, their, give it their best efforts to try and sell plenty more because the more they sell, the more money they're going to make. And so you, you are, uh, it's a good way to enter a market and it's a good way to, to experiment uh, in, in new markets. It's probably less time consuming than the other routes. Jerry, Another thing I'll talk about on. in the next. I, Jerry, before you move on, can I come in with a couple of questions that are coming through? Sure. Okay, so one um, general question is when it comes to picking whether it's a broker, a distributor, or even a customer, you're only kind of meeting them seldom, um, hardly ever. When you're doing business with folks um, that are close to home, you meet them a few times, you look them in the white of the eyes, and at some point there's a sort of an instinct or a gut feel as well as some due diligence. What's your view on doing the same thing? Because if you get it wrong, it's quite critical, and I think a lot of people are concerned about doing a deal and then finding they've picked the wrong person. Any thoughts on the actual choice of the individuals? Well, I would say that you know you you could uh, investigate who else they are dealing with from from the UK, for example, 
and try and speak to some of your peers that are dealing with them and say, well, like, you know, how are these guys doing for you and are they supportive? Are they doing everything that they're promising? And so I would say some investigation, and if they're not dealing with, you know, other British uh, products, then you might start to ask questions. So really, it's, you know, do, do your research with your peers. Okay, that's um, very useful. I think one of the other things that um, is coming across, and we've found this on the other webinar earlier this week, a lot of the smaller businesses in particular in food and drink, they have a, almost a premium, certainly a very important part of their positioning is the Britishness of the brand, the fact that there's a quality associated with it and all the rest of it. And it's something that, that, that's very precious to them and very important in differentiating. Is there very much risk if you start using brokers and agents that they dilute that or don't pay enough um, attention to it? Is, is there any risk there that you're, you want to comment on? Well, there's always some form of business risk with that, but I mean, ultimately, if, if they have if they are interested in representing those products, then it's likely that they, you know, are favorably disposed towards uh, the British products that otherwise they wouldn't be engaging in the first instance. So, I mean, there is a risk, but I'd say you can uh, minimize that risk by just making sure you've chosen the right. about the opportunity is private label work because, you know, I think private label is growing across Europe and certainly in North America where, you know, almost half of the products sold at retail anyway are sold under private label. Uh, and when I say private label, you know, under the likes of uh, Tesco's or Carrefour or Albertson Safeway's name on the box. And if you've got a unique product, which is a good product and a quality product, it might be a way of partnering up with the um, the retailers in these export markets and actually making for their label because they're going to then dedicate you know more time to selling your product under their label but it's going to give you volume and it's going to give you sales and it might be a way of testing the market so I just putting it out there to think you know there there are private label opportunities in these export markets so the next slide then uh, our background on look our background in iTrading is basically all about you know, trying to do a lot of this online. And my background, as I said at the start, what well, you know, we have been in food and drink manufacturing, exporting, brokering, and <laughs> over this experience, I've found that developing an online strategy is a fantastic way and, and probably very cost-effective way of reaching out to new markets uh, from the, the luxury of your your laptop or, or even your your phone. And so I just want to talk a little bit in the last couple of slides here is about the online strategy that you, you should be thinking about. Um, everybody, I would say, should have some online presence. And certainly I would be thinking, you know, everybody should have your own company website, even if it's only a page or two. And, you know, these days, a company, you're building your own website can be done for no money or you can actually spend thousands. But there are software tools online at the moment that will allow you to go and build your own website presence. I would suggest that you know start looking there. Uh, and when you do have your own website, of course, you then have to think about what happens next. How are you going to be found? And to do that, you need to harness all of the social media tools that are there, uh, your, your Facebooks, Twitter, LinkedIn. And, and I would certainly, I'm a big believer in uh, having a company blog. Uh, put lo put lots of great photos about your your company's products. Tell the people stories about how you develop the ideas for your products and your background. Because buyers overseas love to hear this stuff. You know, they they, they like to find out more about the genuine company and people that you are. So tell use all the tools to go out there and do that. Um, and as well, there are, there are online marketplaces that allow you to use their tools to get going and. People like Amazon now are selling food and drink, and it's an easy way to start and a pretty inexpensive way to, to go is with some of these online marketplaces. And putting in a little plug for ourselves, there, you know, we're we're about business to business, and iTrading is about connecting 
food and drink producers to buying opportunities all around the globe. And certainly the, the, the future is all about, uh, certainly future potential is all about the internet and, and we are uh, big advocates of it. And in the next slide then, Jerry, you know, just on, that last, on that last point you made, sure. I think it's a very important point and a couple of people have been asking things related to it. So on the one hand, by having a good online presence, you can get out to people you wouldn't get to. You can probably make yourself seem, appear bigger than you are. But there's a question that says, particularly with things like the private label stuff, there seems to be kind of inner circles, some of the big boys that you want to go and get to. Does the online presence not get in the way, or do you need to supplement it with something else in order to get into the places where it's really about getting into the big boys and doing deals with bigger people? How does, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, well, my, my experience of, of the online is that if you're going direct and, and you're basically going out there and knocking on the doors, going face-to-face -face meetings, wherever that may be, throw up all kinds of, it can be a fundamental strategy, but it's a supplemental strategy to your going directly, and it throws up all kinds of new opportunities from very unexpected places. So, you know, I, I would just use it as a supplementary to, to, to in some direct business. Okay. So, uh, finally, I mean, just going going over that a little bit, I'm re repeating myself a little bit on the last slide there, but, you know, it, it's very important that when you go online, you, you, you know, you, you take it as seriously as you would do when you actually go to meet a person face to face. And I would say, you know, make sure that your content is kept fresh and it is regularly updated and that it is relevant because I would say there, there is a community online that is building constantly, it's getting, you know, bigger by the day and, you know, go out and engage with that community as much as you possibly can. Tell your story online because you, if people start to follow you, for example, on your blog and they keep an eye on what you're doing with, with new recipes and new product development, you know, you'll find that you'll develop a loyal community that will, will spread the word themselves for you and then just will keep getting bigger and bigger and we'll keep uh, we'll, we'll present new opportunities for the tools that are available to you uh, to monitor uh, the, the results of your online work and strategy and finally on the last slide yeah so I mean I, going, going over what I've said there I think that you know, everything is happening online at the moment. There's so many things going on that are disrupting all sorts of industries from, you know, the music industry and, 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 and iTunes and whatnot. And I would say that food and drink and, and industry in general is going to be more and more disrupted by the Internet. And so I would say, you know, uh, pick up the books now about the internet if you don't know it already and, and start to fully engage with it. So thank you very much. Jerry, that's been very useful. I'm going to come back to yourself and probably Lucy in a couple of minutes because there have been quite a few questions that relate to um, the points you both made. But first I want to drop back to some of the points on regulation. Um, uh, Richard, I think I can see that you're back online. Can you hear me? Sorry, we, we uh, had a problem with the connection, so we had to dial back. You're back. We can hear you clearly. I think one of the main things that's been coming out from a lot of folks is the point that I was in the middle of talking about when you dropped off, which is for other sectors, the particular ones that we've got uh, questions on is alcohol, um, chocolates, and confectionery, non-meat. Um, what's the equivalent set of regulations? How do you find them so that people have their version of a, a checklist that they should be going through to make sure? Well, I mean, for, I think probably the, the starting point would be in sort of um, UK TI and um, checking the information there. Um, DEFRA is responsible for certification for a fairly limited range of products. So I think in order to get that information, they, they really need to go to a sort of general site first. Um, and of course, uh, I mean, taking the form of chocolate, I mean, we are in any milk product um, may be covered 
there may be a need for a, an export health certificate. So with that, that may not be the case for every country. So uh, okay. Um, there's been quite a few questions where people are getting very specific, and to the folks that have been asking the, about the Russian Federation and Algeria, the particular questions um, that are being asked I think would be uh, very well put onto open to export because then you can get specific answers. But generalizing them. I think what people are saying is where they're acting uh, and not um, looking at the fact that, I don't know, there's no address on a certificate and therefore they're asking for something else. Um, how, how can you help or what are the point, the things that people should be doing when they find there's a conflict between what they're being asked for from the international market and what the rules here are giving them? Is there anything they can do or is it just um, tough? Well, it, well I, I mean, the first thing I would say is that it, for third countries, countries outside of the EU, it is entirely their discretion about what they can ask for in relation to the you know, guarantees that we can provide. What we do do when we're negotiating is steer them in the direction of the International Animal Health Organization rules and try to, so that we can have, try to have some consistent standards that we all work to. Um, able to argue successfully that those are equivalent to what we have in the EU as well. And we've had some notable successes with that. Okay, and then moving this on to Lucy, if you're there, Lucy. Um, I think quite a few people are asking that is it the right thing to do with some of these very specific situations and, and questions to come to uh, UKTI or the UK-based agencies? Or should we be asking agencies in the countries being exported to? Do you have any views or advice on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, basically we can um, help through our commercial officers on the ground over there. We can actually sort of look into, if people have some very specific requirements or regulations, that is something that we could we could put together. Or if we if we don't have that specific knowledge, we will f we will, we're able to find somebody who can and hopefully put you in touch with them so that you can have a, you know have a very specific chat with them. So generally, you know, if we can't do it, we can find somebody who who, who hopefully can. And one of the things that comes on from that is people have been asking about you have supporting you, whether it's directly at UKTI and commercial officers or through your network. But there's a question about is there enough private sector knowledge within the, the set of folks that you're working with? Um, yeah. or, or is that going to be a little generalist? Well, I mean, it, it does very much depend. In terms of, if, if you're talking about us as international trade advisors, um, basically we're all we're all ex business people. Most people have actually run their own businesses, or we've worked in the industry for a long time, or we've got a lot of contacts. Obviously, all of us have our strengths, you know, in certain areas. But we're all we're all sort of from private industry, and we're all from you know from the commercial sector, and and we've done we've, a lot of us have done what. You at the moment. Um, so um, it, it is worth always chatting to us. And we do very much work as a team as well. If, if, if we don't have the answer to it, we actually do you know, go out to our wider team and go, right, we have that knowledge. Can you speak to this client for me? So we do work very much as a team. In terms of overseas, um, in terms of the companies overseas, a lot of them do come from private industry. Um, it does very much depend on the market, depend on the requirements in the market as to the kind of experience that they do have. Um, but what they do do is they do the research. They, they're able to do research for you. I don't know if that helps you at all. It, it does help. I think that's what people are asking about. Um, moving yeah. on to something that was asked earlier, briefly touched on, but almost asked in a slightly different way. In terms yeah. of trusting the folks that you're meeting online, either brokers, agents, or um, even customers, this yeah. idea, particularly when you're using online channels to identify them, do you have any views on how to reduce your risk or increase the amount of trust and confidence you have in a particular bit of advice or a person you're doing business with internationally? Yeah, I mean yeah, as, as Jerry said, I mean, it is, it is a difficult one. I mean, I totally agree with him in the fact that, you know, you should definitely find out who else that they're working with. That is, if they are in the business, 
can be passionate about and drink is a very helpful industry and you know people will be happy to talk to you. The other way is talk with people, you know, network at all the events, you know, you know, put a name out there and people will think, you know, we'll be able to hopefully say, oh, I know that person but I don't know that person but I might know somebody else who could help you. And if you want to Lucy, I'm not sure if it's just my phone or if it's happening at your end, but I think we're starting to lose your line a little bit. So I'm going to move on. Um, Jerry, when we were talking about the online work, I think one of the questions that's coming back time after time is people aren't sure how to blend their online relationships and work with going out and networking and meeting people at trade shows. Could you talk a little bit about how they'd figure out the right balance, particularly when it costs money to get on a plane, but it feels like you're a lot more confident in what you're doing when you've met people? Yeah, well, I mean, face-to-face -face is always better, but, you know, having the time to do that versus the time to actually keep your your profile up to date, you know, tweeting and blogging and doing all that constantly active um, activity, uh, you know, is a lot easier. And I think it's just it's, it's it's the modern way to keep people abreast of everything that you're doing in terms of you know, product development and product launches. Um, it's like you can reach into. Um, much broader community, good business out of it. Okay. Um, do you have a view on the relative merits of countries that are a little closer to home in all senses of the word, like the EU market in particular and perhaps the US, versus the places further afield like BRICS where it probably is more difficult to get things going, but the opportunities and the scale seem to be huge. Do you have any views, particularly in the context of whether online makes a difference to that exercise, about how you'd place your bets? Well, certainly our experience is that we're seeing all sorts of opportunities coming from China and the Far East and even South America. But, I mean, the majority of the drink companies are small. companies think of expanding and reaching out to, in my view anyway to such far flung places that is very hard to keep supporting and keep revisiting. You know, like there's I think four billion between uh, that goes from from Ireland into the UK and there's about the same amount that goes in the island British Isles and whatnot. You know, there's plenty of business to be had. Uh, and then crossing into Europe of course language starts to play a part. But so if, if it was a small, medium-sized company we're talking about, I think British Isles and, and into uh, North America, USA, Canada is where probably the easiest opportunities are uh, okay. for, for growth. I'd love to uh, longer in time. after we finished, it'll actually for everyone to is Food and Drink Federation's 10-step guide to uh, regulation advice. And I think that's something that's on the website already, um, but it's certainly something that people should be taking a look at. Um, you need to register on Open to Equal to ask your questions. And as I say, once you do that, you'll also see the recording of this webinar, the previous webinar, and a lot of the other things that we've been discussing. Final point is that we are trying to develop our webinar program to get these as close as possible to what people want in terms of topics, formats, approach. When you um, dial off, um, you'll be given four brief questions. If you could take a moment just to answer those, we'd really appreciate it. But at half past three in London, I'd now like to thank our speakers, Lucy, Richard, and Jerry. And it looks like we had nearly 100 people dialing in and listening to this. Thank you, those of you who um, listened to this, and I hope you found it useful. Um, goodbye from London.